All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to WiseLine. We're very happy to have you here today. Hello to all WiseLiners and also to welcome to the people new to our network. My name is Heather Diaz, and I'm a staff software engineer at WiseLine. And well, for those who haven't heard about WiseLine and WiseLine Academy before, let me do a quick introduction. WiseLine is a software development and design services company with operations in the US, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain. We have over six years of experience and more than a thousand employees worldwide. We help other high growth companies to build better products faster through our different disciplines, such as technical writing, UX, project management, and all engineering disciplines, such as software development, QA, AI, mobile, DevOps, and more. Wiseland is a trusted ally of brands such as National Geographic, Shape Security, and the Washington Post. And <clears throat> sorry, as part of our culture, Wiseland empowers employees and the community to innovate and grow their careers. Th this is the reason why Wiseland Academy was created. Um, well, Wiseland Academy is a platform that offers free educational programs such as workshops, talks, and certifications in today's most high valuable skills and technologies. You can follow us on social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn to learn about upcoming courses. As part of our commitment to the community, we love to host awesome people who enjoy contributing to the industry. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, Trevor has been a Node.js developer for over eight years and five of those has a member of the TSC. Recently, he has been doing research and development at NodeSource on how to improve and automatic scaling and of Node.js applications such as, well, sorry, by using low level metrics and the stati statistical models to determine the health of an application in real time. And well, before uh, diving in, uh, I wanna share with you some important notes and code of conduct. Uh, please identify yourself using your Zoom name, I mean, your, your real name. <laughs> Mute your microphone, um, use the chat to ask any question. Please focus your, your questions on the presented topic also, you can turn up your camera in case of connection issues. And please note that recording is not allowed. Um, also, please be respectful. There are no bad questions or ideas. Be welcoming and patient and be careful in the words that you choose. Thanks in advance for helping us having a great event today. Now we are ready to go. So Trevor, the mic is all yours. Thank you. Just to confirm, can you see my desktop? <coughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Welcome everyone, glad to be talking to you about this today, again. And this, today I'll be talking about the insights and analysis that I've gained over many months of research I've done. Uh, all the research I did on the event loop and how we can analyze it and understand it better in order to better scale our applications. So first off, we're gonna look at this event loop. And this event loop is the one in the official Node.js docs. And it is full of all the Node.js implementation details. As we can see, it has every phase such as timers and pull. All of those are specific to Node and not actually necessary for an event loop. This is just how Node works. So the event loop we're gonna be concerned with today is much simpler. All right, the, con the conceptual event loop, unlike this previous one that has several phases, the conceptual event loop only has two phases, as the event provider and the event dispatcher. So the way it works is events are received in, events are received from the event queue. The event queue is usually located in the kernel and it holds all completed events. Say, for example, you write a file to disk and the, an event is placed on the event queue that the task has been completed. Then the event provider makes the call and retrieves the event from the event queue. After the event is received by the event provider it is then dispatched. Usually that, that means the event handler has been called, which is base, basically means that the callback associated with the event is called. But the reason we use the term dispatch is because other things can can happen as well. For example, in libuv, there are some file descriptors where an event is received, 
but then libuv is no longer concerned with those events, so it will simply drop them and continue execution. Now this is a diagram of the event loop uh, and the event loop timeline. We'll go through this very briefly. And number one is the event handler, number two is the event queue. The thick line on it that, go that goes between one and two is the current execution. And then E are the events, L are the loops. So in L1, one important thing to note here though, is that the event loop begins at the pull phase. Unlike, let me go back here again. We can see here that the pull phase occurs in the middle of the Node.js implementation. And this is because it needs to be able to process things at specific times. Again, it's just implement implementation detail that will inhibit our ability to understand exactly what's going on. So in the conceptual event loop, the pull phase is the beginning of event loop execution. Now in L1, it makes the call to the event provider to the event queue. There are no events waiting. So the process will idle until an event's received, which we can see at E1. Then the event is returned and processed. While it's processed, events two and three will be placed into the event queue when loop one is complete. Loop two will begin by making call into the event provider and retrieving events two and three. A couple of important things to note here, that gap of time between L1 and E1 where nothing is occurring is what we'll call idle time. And events two and three, which are placed into the event queue while event one is being processed are events waiting. And I think you can get from the summary from the rest of how execution goes, you can read those from the notes. But continuing on, why does, why does this matter? Why does understanding that diagram matter in our case? Well, first off, it's easier to make inferences of the event loop and the metrics. When I first began my research, I included metrics in over 30 locations and quickly it became apparent that it'd be too difficult to track everything and to understand what was going on. It had to be simplified. So a further research showed that I could simplify those and remove metrics without losing the fidelity, fidelity of the information that I needed and the accuracy that was required for high precision monitoring. So we can do this. See, unlike in nodes event loop, if you remember, it had timers phase and close callback phase, which aren't directly triggered from the execution of an event from the pull phase, we can make the assumption that all execution time within the event loop is a result of some event. This is a safe assumption to make when monitoring your applications. And finally, yeah, without doing the simplifications, without doing these above simplifications, it would just be impossible to do further in-depth analysis. So first off, let's start with idle time. If you remember the gap between L1 and E1 is what we call considered idle time. It's the first and most basic metric of the event provider. And calculating the idle time really isn't as simple as saying the amount of time that you're in the event provider, or in other words, say you were to call ePoll wait, the amount of time that you're in ePoll cannot be considered all idle time. Otherwise, you are not, <clears throat> because at times if there are events waiting, then no time was actually spent idle. So we need to compensate for that. So we'll get to the implementation details in a minute, but right now the idle time is currently implemented in Node in the Perfox API. And also I don't have it here, but the workers API as well. So the implementation notes that there are no event provider APIs for example, you pull wait or KQ, any of those, when you make the call, you simply give it the timeout and then it returns whether an event has been received after the timeout. It does not let you know if an event has been immediately waiting. And so a change needed to be made when I patched libuv to support idle time, I had to make it so that the event provider would be called or ePoll would be called with a timeout of zero. First, it always does this. Then it can detect whether any events were waiting when poll was called. Then after that, if no events were waiting, it will make a subsequent call 
and a subsequent call, call will be considered idle time. While this is a minor correction, I did find it important to do in order to get the most accurate measurements possible. So later on, we'll see that, um, later on I'll show how we make, can create trends with this information in order to better understand our, and scale our applications. Again, this higher fidelity was necessary in order to do that. Now, continuing on to event loop utilization, which is another metric recently introduced into Node. So simply to find the event loop utilization is the percentage of time the event loop is not idle. So unlike CPU, EL, EL, the ELU can never be greater than 100%, which is an advantage in monitoring. Currently, with node processes, it's very easy to go over 100%. So by simply setting a scaling value of, say, 80% CPU before, before you fire another process, we have a better way to gauge when that needs to happen. So the advantages are it is more precise than CPU, and also the ELU of each worker thread can be measured. There is no cross-platform way to measure CPU per thread, but ELU does allow us to do this. So uh, the event loop utilization has landed in both perfooks and worker threads. Now we're going to look at some differences between CPU and event loop utilization, and I have some graphs to show that. On this first graph, these are the simplest cases. Both of these are different type of HTTP server workloads. Now, when the x-axis is an increase in the amount of traffic or number of connections, the left y-axis is the number of requests per period. By per period, what I mean is that What I mean is the amount of the number of requests received in a collection iteration. The reason for doing this instead of doing a request per second is because it gives us a better curve for analysis. And the right side is the CPU and ELU percentage. And as you can see in both of these, the curves and the data for ELU and CPU trend very closely through the entire thing. And this is probably your standard case where almost all time within the script is spent processing the script. There's no extraneous or un unnecessary things happening. This could be, this is a good indication that your script is doing what you intend it to be doing. It doesn't guarantee that your code is efficient, just that it doesn't have any external issues. So this first one, on uh, the top right is the same as the previous one, or similar to the previous one. But the difference is that it makes a lot of external requests and then it stores the objects from the request that it received into memory and it saves those until the request is completed. This places a lot of stress on the garbage collector. Now, fortunately, V8 is pretty intelligent and it's able to do the cleanup of that garbage off the main thread. So as we can see here, as we can see here, the ELU barely reaches 80% before CPU reaches 100%. So if you're setting your scaling threshold at say 75%, you're scaling well early of where you actually need to be and wasting, um, wasting resources. Now the second one, bottom left, is an HTTPS server that does a, a lot of additional cryptography and generate random data and such. Also, we can see that it forces CPU to be a lot higher than the ELU, leading us to a similar case as the first one. Now, these two graphs are examples of using worker threads. And we, as we can see on the top left, that CPU usage goes all the way up to 300%. This simply, this very easily points out the fact that using CPU to scale your application with when you're using worker threads is absolutely useless. But what we can see is uh, by viewing the ELU of the main thread, we can see how well the application is performing overall. And at the end, ELU never, 
never got above about 70% because I limited the number of workers that were able to process the templates and do other work that was necessary. So in the graph in the bottom right, I allowed the, I increased the number of workers that could spawn and do work. And as we can see, once uh, the total amount of work that the application, that the process could complete increased from approximately 300 requests per period to over 400 requests per period simply by understanding and we were able to adjust for that by understanding the ELU of the main thread. Now this graph here, the top left, is, is the same as the previous one except that I ran it within a container and limited the number of CPU resources. And so as we can see it maxes out at about 100% even though it's running three, I believe in this case it was three worker threads. And we can see that ELU is slowly increasing even though CPU is flat. This has to do with the amount of, the amount of time the kernel is spent swapping and doing other tasks. But by using a combination of ELU and CPU in this case, we can see that uh, we can identify the fact that hardware is the limitation and not the software. So while EOU can be, or in most cases, is a better way, as a better indicator of the overall health of the process, using the two in conjunction can help us find other issues. Now the bottom graph is a very unusual one. What I did there was mount a network drive and I wrote to it synchronously. Now, if you open a file with the RS plus flag, it will force the operation to complete, or it will force the write to complete before it will return. And then if you use the file system's write sync, basically it will hold, it will hold the process until the write over the network has been completed. What, what happens here is that the ELU is then much higher than the CPU. Because even though the CPU isn't being occupied while it's waiting for the file to be written over the network, the ELU is blocked and prevented from further processing other, other events. <clears throat> so we can also use ELU as a form of anomaly detection. Now in this graph, what I've done is take several, I think about a dozen different processes and I took their CPU and ELU and I graphed the x-axis here is the ELU and the y-axis is CPU. And as we can see that there is a fairly distinct trend between the two, but in two cases, in two processes, <clears throat> there are anomalies that cause it to shoot off in various directions. Now we can use this information to detect that there is, uh, we can use this additional information to detect when a process needs to be looked at more than just detecting like is is the CPU too high or the number of requests not high enough by doing cross process comparison and ELU allows us to do this cross process comparison because it's a more stable and more ac accurate metric. So now we're going to talk about scaling by responsiveness. And first I wanna ask, what's the purpose of scaling? Why do we scale our applications? If we wanted to save on costs, we could spawn very few processes and then force our users to wait while, the, while we served up their request. So the reason we scale is to provide reliable and responsive experience for the users. Problem is that unlike CPU and ELU, it's impossible to set a constant value. You can't give the same responsiveness for different applications based on these two metrics alone. It's just impossible to do. So what we're going to, what we're going to do is track responsiveness over time uh, and scale based on the trends over different applications. But in order to do this, we need a new metric other than idle time and event loop utilization. And this is event delay. So first we're just gonna give a quick definition of what event delay is. Now, if we remember back in our earlier slide, or sorry, we will get to it in a second. The event provider delay is the amount of delay from when the event is placed in the event queue until it's received by the event provider. Then the event processing delay 
is the time from when the event is received from the provider until the event handler is called. And the sum of the two is the event delay. But honestly, I, even when I write this, it's still confusing me. So I like, I like diagrams, these are nice. This will help us see what's going on. Now this timeline is the same as before, except that it has the additional information of the amount of delay per event until each event is processed. And specifically in D3, we can see that the total amount of delay from when E3 is received into the event provider until, or sorry, total time between when E3 is placed in the event queue until it is processed. The problem with node is that it's impossible to know when an event is placed into the event queue. It's just a limitation and something that people, it's, it's a trade-off where node is very powerful in some ways, this is one bit of information that we lose, but we can't estimate it. So we're gonna, here we're gonna talk about how to calculate event delay, even though we can't exactly know when the event is placed in the event queue. So what we can do is by using the idle time with the, with the duration of a, how long one loop takes to execute, plus the number of events waiting and the number of events processed. So the number of events waiting, we could say, looking back here, is when L2 is called, the number of events waiting would be two for E2 and three. When loop three is called, the number of events waiting would be one for events for event four. So that's event, those events waiting, and then the total of events processed are just the total number of events that have been executed within a single loop. So I, we'll need those four metrics in order to calculate the total event delay. And beyond that, we then need to use, I, we could use other statistical models, but the easiest one and still very reliable is just using a simple uniform distribution to do the calculation. Now, I further, uh, this to do this, it was, it was necessary to further patch libbyv. And so right now only in solid can do the calculation, but plans have been made to open source this technology in the future. Now let's look at some other graphs to see what it looks like. Now the x-axis here is the ELU so that we can do the more accurate comparisons. The red dots are latency per request or how long each request takes to you know, respond from an HTTP server. And the blue points are the sum of the event delay, basically the sum of all delay for all events within a single loop for that duration of time. And as we can see here, we're able to trend very closely to the overall latency using just that metric. And as we'd expect, the increase of the increased required resources to respond to the user causes the, each request to slow down. Now the curvature of each of these is going to be different, but by using this, we'll be able to estimate the health of the application. And what's nice about using event delay is that we'll be able to we'll be able to estimate the health of the application without looking at the application directly. This is very useful for doing. Well, first off, it's useful because it doesn't have any overhead. Measuring this is on the is on the order of additional CPU cycles per second. It's a very simple thing to track. But likewise, since it's application agnostic, and I'll show later that this even even trends with unexpected scenarios, we're able to use it reliably. So in this <coughs> excuse me. So in this first one, now unlike, unlike these two, where they have a pretty solid curve up around 60, 70% is probably where you'd want to scale in these cases if you wanted to give a, a uniform user experience. In the top right case, you wouldn't have to scale until 85, 90% in order to give your users the same experience. And the advantage here is the number of the total costs that you're saving by spawning fewer resources or fewer pro spawning fewer processes over time will not 
affecting your user's experience. But also there are cases I found, I don't have a graph here where, actually, no, I do have a graph. It'll be the next one. We'll go over in a second. And the bottom one is the case of using worker threads. And it maxed out, uh, this is the one before using approximately four workers in order to serve up requests. And we can see at the beginning, it's fairly, fairly linear. And then it becomes sporadic. So the trend is, for, is pretty much the same. The responsiveness of each request is pretty much the same. But because of the machine's need to do, of handling different threads, it does get more, there's a lot more variation. And so we can compensate for this by looking at the event delay and understanding exactly how much, even how many workers are useful until uh, how many workers we can use without affecting the user's experience. Now, this case was a weird one. And what's happening here is if we look at the latency per request, around 55%, the amount of lat latency per request spoke, um, went up dramatically. And then weirdly, it came back down around 70%. And, and after further research, I found the reason for this was because uh, V8 was able to handle the script better. It was able to do the garbage collection better. I'm not exactly sure of the specifics, is, but it was V8 simply having a hard time with the script in this case. And in my opinion, it shows a lot to the event delay, being able to trend that closely with the actual latency per request, even in these weird scenarios. So now the takeaway here is that by improving our understanding of the event loop, we've found superior ways to determine the health of an application. And it's possible to closely approximate the state of the process by only viewing the event loop. And it's important to understand the scaling curve of the application. So when you're doing the load tests, it's important to to track how it responds at all levels. A lot of load tests I see only track the maximum number of requests before the application fails, when what they should be tracking, more importantly, are the curves that are given. So in these cases, you can see that yes, while we might be able to serve up 300 requests per second in total, we never want to get to that point. What will happen is that the user's experience at that point will be abysmal and everybody will be leaving the site. So by, by tracking the graph through the entire process of scaling, we can determine not only the maximum capacity, but also the scaling points. And the graph that you create when doing your load testing can be used as a model in production of when you need to, of when you need to scale. And then you can do comparisons of your model against your actual application as it's running. And this can give you additional insight into, well, whether your, whether your load testing is accurate and useful, and also the best ways to, the best ways to improve your user's experience. And in cases like this, you can go back and look at your code and just see what the heck's going on. So I'd like to briefly talk about nSolid. Now, all the metrics, all the metrics I've talked about and additional metrics are all currently part of NSolid. And also NSolid is not limited by the state of the application. The metrics are all returned at constant intervals, unlike when an event loop is blocked for a long duration of time and event and metrics aren't being able to be sent back, we're able to get around that. Also, soon NSolid will have full worker thread support. We'll be able to do remote triggering of snatch ops and CPUs the CPU profiles for all threads, along with tracking metrics of each individual worker thread. And we're currently developing the ability to do that cross-process trending and tracking, as I've talked about earlier. And honestly, I started, I started in this, I remember I first started talking about this two years ago. I foresaw workers becoming kind of an issue. Like Node has touted itself as a you know single single threaded thing, which is great, honestly.
But now in the world of worker threads, things have changed and no developers, I don't, I don't believe are completely ready for it. And so the tooling and the research I've done and the tooling we've created is to help no developers come into this new world of multi-threaded computing so that they can make their processes as reliable and fault tolerant as possible. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, well, remind you that uh, if you have any question, please post it in the chat. Uh, we have one from Karen Flores. She says, what is the minimum number of requests needed to have a multi The min minimum number of requests completely depends on the type of HTTP server. When I was doing my modeling, I created, I modeled probably two different two dozen different types of workloads. And each one, let me go back. Sorry, I'm gonna share my screen again. All right, you can see this. So these are two different HTTP servers. And as you can see, the scaling curve is very, very different. It's because they do completely different types of work. So like the bottom graph here, I mean, it's the, the request per period and even the latency per request there was completely linear right up until it hit 100%, whereas the other one had a very gradual curve as the number of requests increased. So the number of requests needed really varies. Um, I wrote some that did very simple date template processing that I was able to do 10,000 requests per second before it maxed out. I had other ones that did very complex requests that could only do five or six requests per second before before it'd start to fail. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, any uh, other question? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, and does the complexity of the application processes um, have an impact on how do you see how you see the latency? Or it doesn't yeah, the the yes, you can uh, roughly can break things down into two areas: is the number of computation needed in order to complete a request, and the amount of external external I.O. needed in order to complete the request, where external I.O. would be making another database, uh, making database request to fulfill a template, something of that sort, and then the amount of time needed to, print, to generate the template in order to complete the request. Things basically break down in those two areas. And it, you know, there's the, the different levels of complexity is how, how well those two interact. And also say, for example, um, say, for example, you have a server that the overall, like the total processing time necessary to complete the request would only be 10 milliseconds, but your backend server giving you the data to complete each request is taking quite a while. What's going to happen is that your server is going to have lots of pending requests, creating a lot more objects, putting more stress on the garbage collector. And so even the same application the, the scaling curve can change drastically depending on the resources that that server depends on in order to complete each request. Awesome. Uh, and are you able to identify the processes or is that not possible? But the right. ones that are having a lot of uh, work, workload. Yes. Yeah, It um, not with, not with only these metrics, it's also possible to do with other metrics, uh, like in solid, we keep, and I mean, Node has these too, the number of active handles and active requests, so we can see how many pending requests are waiting to be served, and how many external IO requests are necessary in order to complete those. And so by tracking the overall latency per request and correlating that with the number of excuse me, correlating that with the, the amount of time it takes for each request. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. By correlating the number of handles 
that are waiting to be completed with the total time it takes to complete them, we're able to determine if the back end, if the back end is what's slow, you know, if the thing sending node the information it needs is slow or, or if node itself is being slow in completing their template processing. Okay, thank you. And the reason we have some time, remember if you're shy, we can put it, you, you can just type in chat and I can read. <laughs> Well, another one. Uh, do you have, uh, do you, uh, have you work with time windows on this type of, uh, of, um, like models? And because uh, there are some thing analytics that uh, you can work with uh, time windows, but they usually don't. And um, they say that if you have a, a time window that is very long, they discourage the use of that because it it will lower the the data throughput. So does that work with this or can, can you work with time windows? On time this window. Model? Did you say time window? Yeah, yeah, time window. Sorry, I'm not completely sure what a time window is but of um, well, um, and, uh, well, in that is my, what um, sometimes you can do with stream analytics on Azure that you can set up a time window of, let's say 10 seconds and you can see all the events in the last 10 seconds and then compare it to the next 10, 10 seconds time window. So those uh, models can take advantage of, of or can take a look at uh, if there are some time windows that are uh, increasing the latency. Okay, yeah, yeah, the models will work with that. It, you just need to do some, some adjustments in terms of how it does the, the calculation to account for that. But uh, I mean, the event loop itself isn't, doesn't fire at steady intervals. One event loop ex execution might take one millisecond, another ex event loop execution like the iteration execution time might be 200 milliseconds. So taking the data from irregular intervals and being able to model it is very, is possible. In fact, it's kind of a requirement in order to work with event loops. Oh, okay, perfect. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other question? I guess not. So, well, thank you very much, Trevor, for that awesome presentation. And th thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, if you could spend some, some minutes providing feedback, we put a, a link in the chat to, for you to, to fill a short survey and we will really ap appreciate it. And well, once again, thank you everyone and have a, a wonderful day and yeah, give it up to, to Trevor. Thank you, everybody can, who attended. You can mute your, your mics and clap if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.